So welcome back everyone to uh, this month's uh, set of talks. So we have two speakers today, Ois and Sen and Jörg Bokoven. Um, so as usual, the session will be recorded. It will go up on YouTube afterwards. Um, as the questions are going on and as the questions go, as the talks are going on, please feel free to dive into the chat with any questions that you've got. We can redact questions afterwards if you want conversations to be off the record. So we do the same with the speakers as well. So the speakers can have anything they're discussing can be taken off the record afterwards. So please, questions in the chat. Each talk will be about 20 to 25 minutes, followed by a brief discussion. And then once the hour's up, we'll have a bit of a general chat afterwards as usual. So Ayusman, you're up first. So the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thanks. Um... So um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of our work on designing applications. Um, James wanted me to talk about applications, which basically means looking into the future. And as you see at the bottom of the slide, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So, um, but, but I'll try. Um, and, and this is sort of our vision, which, which is, you know, hum, human beings are robots shrunk down in a spaceship kind of thing, going through the bloodstream, repairing stuff in your body and so on. Um, so what we are trying to do is, is of course, design synthetic active matter that exhibits emergent properties through functions. Uh, and this involves interactions with each other and interactions with the environment. And this requires the use of free energy. So these are all systems driven uh, far out of equilibrium. And, and to achieve this, you need two distinct things. One is you need something that can work on information. Uh, and typically these are self-powered objects that harvest energy locally. Uh, and the other thing you need is an information in the form of code. Uh, and in our case, these are all, uh, in the form of chemical gradients, sometimes in the form of optical gradients and so on. And so the combination of uh, information and something that can uh, work on the information will then lead to interesting collective behavior, uh, emergent behavior. So one thing I do want to point out is that we're not talking about external field-driven things. Uh, you can, of course, move things uh, by magnetic or electric fields, uh, but those are lockstep uh, behavior. We're not interested in those. We're interested in things that would harvest energy locally, make their own decisions, uh, and act on those decisions. And so in our case, this involves catalysis, much like what the living systems uh, do. Uh, and in while we're talking about the analogy with living systems, I want to uh, stress um, a couple of things. First, um, you know, the field has progressed uh, from the field of materials in general, I'm talking about now, from passive nanostructures like coatings and polymers to active structures like actuators, amplifiers, to now what we think should be the next step, which is the systems of active nanostructures. And the goal here is to accomplish tasks that no other tool can do. It's not good enough to do something better. If you really want to establish this field, we need to show that these nanomachines and nanomotors can do something that nothing else can do. And, and, in, and in this area, I want to sort of ask you to think about the concept of systems material, which is the study of, uh, which is a study of <clears throat> interactions and feedback between individual units in an active system. And the important questions there are things like, do such systems need to be based on modular structures? Do these modular structures assemble themselves based on interactions? Or do you need some kind of programming and external control? Something that is critical is, where in the system is the information stored that allows them to assemble, to communicate, to do functions? And in this sense, um, this is like synthetic biology or systems biology. In systems biology, you, you think about cells to tissues to organisms. So 
I'm, I'm talking with systems material in the same, uh, same sense. Now, uh, in terms of applications, there are many possible applications. This is a laundry list of some that I've come up with. I'm sure that I've left out large chunks of other applications. Um, and, and I don't have the time to, to go through all of them. So I'll, I'll talk about a few of these, um, uh, these applications. And I want to uh, use enzymes, which are in my mind, the ultimate molecular machines as exemplars to highlight some of these, uh, these applications. So uh, it's been a while now, but we've, we showed that enzymes when the catalyzed reactions um, uh, <clears throat> produce mechanical energy. Uh, so the chemical energy that comes out of catalysis is converted into mechanical motion, which can manifest itself uh, as uh, enhanced diffusion, for example, and you can do a back of the envelope calculation, and it's about 10 to 15 piconeutrons per turnover. Now, these are not motor proteins. These are just free floating enzymes. And, and, and you can see it's, here's just one example. We've looked at many, many ex examples of enzymes where you can see that the diffusion increases with increasing substrate concentration, which means that this is directly tied to the reaction rate uh, of the reaction and the free energy change uh, that, that happens. A more interesting feature is this chemotaxis, which used to be thought of as something that only living systems did, uh, but we showed that in fact, even active molecules will do it. Uh, and you can show this in many different ways. The definition of chemotaxis is simply movement towards or away from a chemical gradient. In this case, the chemical gradient is of the substrate or food, if you will. And so if you have a microchannel with three inlets and you put an enzyme equal concentration in all three so that you have an equilibrium distribution of the enzyme, and then if you pass the substrate to the middle channel, the enzymes for the flanking channels will move in and focus. So you go from an equilibrium distribution of enzyme to a non-equilibrium distribution. And so you can direct things this way. You can also attach the enzymes to larger particles and move these larger particles. And this has been shown by us and many other people. Uh, and you can direct them through, through chemotaxis. Um, you can separate uh, proteins, enzymes um, that might be otherwise identical in size, identical in charge, simply by chemotaxis. So you can fast, for example, active and inactive enzymes through one channel, substrate through the other, and only the active enzyme will chemotax and will come out of the end. We show this here for active and inactive catalase, which are otherwise identical. And you can see uh, quite a bit of separation. Now, um, so one of the applications in, in catalysis, trying to make it catalysis more efficient, especially in terms of tandem Catalysis and the inspiration here uh, is is the so-called metabolon formation. So in your body, you have these enzyme cascades. For example, there's an enzyme cascade for conversion of glucose into ATP, uh, and there are some twenty enzymes involved in this cascade. The first enzyme acts in glucose, makes something. That's the substrate for the second. The second enzyme makes something. That's the substrate for the third and so on. And what people have shown is that if you add the substrate for the first enzyme, all these enzymes will come together. And these are called metabolins, and you can actually see them. Here's, a, here's an illustration from science. Uh, this is not the, uh, the glycolysis cascade. It's a pure synthesis ca cascade. But you can clearly see these micron-sized particles which are the assembly of all these enzymes. And then when, when they run out of substrate, they disperse again. And nature does it because this helps make the cat catalysis efficient. You just hand over the catalyst from one to the other. Uh, you don't lose the intermediates into the bulk solution. If the intermediate is unstable, you don't decompose it because it just gets handed over. The, Fundamental question, however, is what brings them together? 
And that's not understood well. And our hypothesis was that it is just chemotaxis. The first enzyme makes the food for the second. So the second enzyme chemotaxis towards the first. The second enzyme makes the food for the third. And so the third moves towards the second and so on. And we showed this by looking at four different enzymes, the first four enzymes in the glycolysis cascade. And we labeled hexokinin, which is the first enzyme, and aldolin, the fourth enzyme. And we again had a microchannel set up where you put the first and the second enzyme in one flanking channel, and the third and the fourth in the other, and you pass D glucose through the middle. And D glucose is the substrate for the hexokinase, the first enzyme. So hexokinase immediately chemotaxis into the middle channel. The next one has to wait until its substrate, which is glucose 6-phosphate is formed and then it too will chemotax and so on. And aldolase, which is the fourth enzyme in the series, has to wait until its substrate is produced by the action of the first three enzymes. So there's a time delay and you can clearly see this time delay. Uh, so, so you can, this shows that in fact you can bring, and, and everything I say today applies not just enzymes, but for every catalyst that we have looked at at least, uh, that if you have catalytic cascades, then chemotax taxes helps speed up the reaction and you have less side products and so on. So, so that's one application. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is this directionality brought about by chemotaxis uh, uh, can be used as an information processor. Uh, and this is a fundamental question of, of how you organize active matter, how information arises from energy or chemical gradients. And what I'm saying is if you have, let's say, a thousand proteins in solution, and if I add the substrate for one of them, if it's an enzyme, then only those which are tied to each other through a catalytic cascade will come together, and they will come together in a sequential manner. So it is a way of organizing matter. And I should note here that both the motility and the communication arises from the same chemical gradient. Okay, it's the same chemical gradient that causes the motion and the communication part of it. And this is something often theoretical physicists um, lose sight of. For example, the Vitchek model that's often used just assumes that there is some motion going on and then you have impose rules like how they interact and so on, but the motion and the interaction are tied together. And this is something important to remember. Okay. Um, and this brings me to um, the fact that if you, you can drip things by chemotaxis uh, has led directly to many biomedical applications, mostly uh, proof of concept type applications at the moment where you can build containers, you can get put enzymes into the containers, drugs into the containers. You can close or open the containers so to allow things to pass in and out. You can move them directionally through chemotaxis, either positive or negative chemotaxis and so on. So, so there are some medical applications uh, of these things. Um, but of course, there are other factors to take into account. And we published this little essay in small, uh, and we talked about some of the things you need to do. So biocompatibility is obviously one of them. Moving through body fluids. Um, how do you move against blood flow? You have to have a machine that's powerful enough. Or you could reotax, which is they can move along the walls where the flow is minimal. And, the, and we and others have shown examples of particles that will move against the flow in that way. Um, you have to overcome interstitial pressures of cells to enter the cells, targeting, and, and so on and so forth. So I won't spend too much time on it, uh, but only stress the fact that one of the most important things is how do you negotiate body fluids? And when you go from, let's say, the blood to the epithelial cells and the tissues, you need to switch fuel because in the blood, the most accessible 
fuel is glucose, maybe something else in the cell and so on. And so you need um, machines and motors that use many different kinds of fuel. Of course, you don't have to negotiate through any fluids uh, that, that's moving. If you work in the GI tract or in, in the bladder, um, and so, so there has been a lot of work going on in, of using uh, these things, the active you know, enzyme-powered motors for bladder cancer treatment. This is work by Samuel Sanchez, uh, and, who, which show, and he showed that these active particles can penetrate these cancer um, cells much more than, than inactive ones. And Joe Wan has been working on GI tract, where again, there is no question of fluid flow. And, and so you don't have to think about that. Okay, uh, I want to talk, talk just a little bit about um, <clears throat> rheology of fluids, tuning them by active particles. How do you change rheology uh, of fluids on the fly? Uh, and this has to do with um, the fact that if you have active particles, it, they not only move around, but they also cause inactive things to move around and all this churning and motion causes changes in viscosity. And, and as an example of something that happens in the cell, there was a paper by Christine Jacobs Wagner uh, that I show here. Uh, and she showed that uh, bacterial cytoplasm when she was working with E. coli cells, um, uh, uh, if, you, if you shut down all the enzymes, not just the motor proteins, but all the enzymes, they adopt a glass-like property and they're only fluidized when you turn on the enzymes through met metabolic activity. So, so it, it, it shows that, it, the, that active particles are absolutely essential in living systems to get things moving inside cells and, and, and so on. But also you could think of using it um, in, in other possible applications. The last thing I want to talk about is analyte-triggered pumping. Uh, which is coupling, uh, coupling chemical sensing with microfluidic pumping. Uh, and uh, this has to do with the fact that I, I just told you that the enzymes, when they're catalyzing reactions, generate mechanical force, impulsive force. Now, if you attach the enzyme to a surface, they don't move, so the force is transmitted to the fluid around it. And that's, that's actually um, my answer anyway to the um, bounty question that was posed, which is that if you want to go from nanoscale motion to something that's macroscale, that's one way of doing it. In this case, uh, the nanoscale motion of the individual enzyme molecules uh, uh, get, gets translated into the macroscale motion of the fluid by simply having many of these enzymes attached to a surface. And you just, you just um, add the fluid at the substrate uh, and um, and you and you and you um, and you can add trace of particles if you wish, so that you can see um, um, the fluid flow. And depending on the enzyme, the fluid moves one way or the other. And if it's a fuel system, then you have circular uh, fluid flow. So we've looked at many different ones. Uh, here are some trace of particles moving um, in a catalase pump, but we have catalase, glucose oxidase, urease, you name it, alkaline phosphatase. And in every case, just like the enzymes themselves, these pumps, the fluid pumping speed depends on the reaction rate. And so you can control the fluid pumping that way. And um, of course, they run down when they, as they consume the uh, substrate, um, uh, but you can recharge them by adding more substrate. Uh, and you can get back the original out pumping. I, we show this with, with um, uh, in the case of catalase, you add more H2O2 or urease, you, you add more urea. So these are really, um, really sensors come pumps because they only pump fluid when they sense their own substrate or biomarker. They don't require an external power source. And so there are a number of applications of this. Um, for example, active drug delivery, we showed, for example, that, that you can take a hydrogel, fill it up with insulin, attach your glucose oxidase to it, and if you put it in a solution of glucose, it's, the glucose oxidase starts pumping and pumping out the 
uh, insulin. And remember that the pumping rate depends on how much glucose you have around the substrate. Well, and so more glucose, more insulin is pumped out. So this is an example of on-demand delivery of insulin. Uh, we have looked at other examples. For example, um, here's an example where we were looking at neutralizing nerve agents. Uh, so in this case, the, the nerve agents are usually organophosphates. Uh, so in this case, um, the enzyme is uh, phosphatase, which hydrolyzes the organophosphates. Uh, and, we can, and we can fill this gel with some antidote. And depending on the concentration of the organophosphate, we can we can pump out more or less of the antidote. Of course, we use this surrogate for the uh, nerve agents since we are reluctant to kill our graduate students. But we did tell the, um, tell the army the, the way to make these pumps and they in fact showed that you can take the nastiest of the nasty nerve agent like Solmon and, and neutralize them but using these pumps because these pumps actively draw in the fluid uh, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, neutralize them. Um, you can also use the inhibition of the pumping um, by toxins to measure the amount of toxin. Here's just one example of detecting mercury ion using urease, and we can detect um, as low as 0 0.02 parts per billion of mercury, which is well below the EPA, EPA limit. Um, I think I'll skip this because I don't have enough time. Uh, so this is this is a list, and, and uh, you know there are other applications. Uh, James wanted me to um, um, talk about you know short-term applications and long-term applications, uh, but instead, uh, what I want to do is to stress the fact that for many of these applications, you need to bring together chemists and physicists and engineers uh, and so on. And so I want to end with just one more slide uh, where I show how you can bring people from different disciplines to build up uh, um, an, a, an application platform. And in this case, this platform is this is this fluid pumping that I just talked about the catalytic fluid pumping, uh, and and so so here is um, uh, what I was uh, talking about. So you can use this automatic flu uh, uh, fluid pumping for distributing man distributed manufacturing and diagnostics. Remember that you don't need an external power source to pump fluid in this case. And so you can use them in remote areas, which means you can do distributed manufacturing. People can make their own chemicals, they can do their own diagnostics and so on. But the whole thing has to start from a fundamental basis uh, of theory, experiment, and design, where you think about cascades and kinetics and fluid flow um, and what kind of materials you need and modeling and non-equilibrium interfaces you have to uh, you have to um, solve these barriers, and then you can get a technology base where you can think about what kind of chip-based autonomous microfluidic devices you can construct, what kind of software you need to control them, what design tools are necessary, and then you can start to build a technology platform um, which would benefit people uh, in remote areas, for example, you have to talk to stakeholders like individual users, industry, policymakers, et cetera, uh, and, and so on. Um, so so it, it, it's a big enterprise. It's not something one person can do easily. Um, but uh, if you bring together people in centers, um, I think that's, that's one way of going, it's going from. Uh, a discovery to something that people can start to use. So I'll I'll stop here and um, and then I'm, I'm happy to uh, take questions. And thanks very much, Iosman. Um, and yeah, you're changing the uh, narrative at the end there by posing your own challenge instead. But uh, I I can appreciate that. Uh, Bit of a rule breaking never hurt anybody, I suppose. <laughs> so we've had a few 
a few questions come in. I'll actually, I think I've found in recent times reading them out. Actually, yeah, I can, I can go to, you want to answer. Go to, if you want to engage with the chat, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, people use oscillating magnetic fields that can move magnetic particles rather than static fields. That's one example. Yes, absolutely true. And, and, and people like Pierre Fisher and, um, God, I'm I'm getting old and forgetting names, but they're using magnetic particles to do eye surgery. So they move these things around, uh, and and um, and have these magnetic particles in the eye, uh, and 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 do surgery. So yes, that's absolutely possible. Um, um, so what I talked about today was exclusively about. Uh, chemically powered systems, but that's not the only way to do this. Magnetic is one. Acoustic is a very attractive way of doing this uh, because it's already used in in medical treatments, you know, ultrasonic imaging and so on. And acoustic power can move particles very, very fast. They're not so the magnetic and acoustic ways of moving things are less precise. But if you want to go long distances, that's what what you want to do. And then when you get very close to the target, maybe you want to switch on chemical sensing. And so that, that would be my solution. Uh, oh, okay. I started from the last question first. Sorry. Um, okay. Oh, that was, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that was what I think. And Gene, this Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, um, so you're asking uh, what is the mechanism of chemotaxis? And we have published that um, um, uh, in um, Nature Chemistry, where we talked about the metabolome formation, uh, and also in a, in a follow-up biochemistry uh, paper. Basically, it has to do with the fact that if the substrate binding is thermodynamically favorable, then the enzyme will, will cross diffuse towards the substrate because by doing so and binding to the substrate, you, you lower the uh, total energy of the system. So it's a lowering of the chemical potential that causes this to happen. So this is to us much less mysterious than the enhanced diffusion, which people are fighting over. And I've tried to, I started this whole thing and now I'm trying to stay over, uh, above the fray, so to speak. Um, had any self-directed motility. Yeah, um, so as I said, if you want to look up our papers in Nature Chemistry, and well, actually the best place would be our 2018 Accounts of Chemical Research, where I summarize uh, the enzyme diffusion, the enzyme chemotaxis, and the enzyme pumps. So that would be the great place to start if you want to. Um, You'll find our useful there is a, a, then a big, conversation the chat about the questions you were just answering and um, so we had a lot of engagement there if you don't spend um what will it be it'll be 2 30 for you there's a question by tad hogg okay about, um which is what limits complexity of information processing in these systems and they, for example can they have memory to only move when detect boolean combinations of chemicals, but not seeing another chemical previously. Yeah, so we speculated about how to build in memory. Uh, we had a perspective in chem uh, on that about how to build in memory. And and one thing I should stress is, you know, our mechanism of chemotaxin is very different from the bacterial me the method of chemo measuring, you know, doing chemotaxis, which involves a, a temporal memory. We do not know how to build a temporal memory. Uh, and that is, a, is an excellent challenge. I mean, you can do trivial things like build an hysteresis loop, for example, which is kind of a primitive memory. But I think we need something that has a temporal memory. And I, I don't know the answer. Can you build a temporal memory with a like RNA polymerase or something like that? It might be exotic and complicated, but still, that's kind of the way memory is done in BIOS. Go for it. I, I know not, not that. <laughs> so I know so little about uh, RNAs and DNA systems. I stay away from it. My first rule of thumb is never compete with anyone younger than you are because you'll always lose. They have so much more energy, but, 
but yes, uh, I think that that's a, that's a good point in all seriousness. Um, there is a one by Dan Korshland about how you can measure differences in concentration rather than absolute concentration. And we, we talked about this model by Dan Korshland uh, in the chem perspective. And, and he does it through a, a two enzyme network with a feedback loop. And you may want to look at that if you're interested in building memory. Yeah, so, uh, James, you tell me which, what I should answer because there are quite a few questions. Yeah, I, I think actually we'll pro we'll pro we should probably wrap it up now to keep everything on track. Okay. And I think most of it actually is discussion. You've, you've generated more discussion than I can remember us having in, in many months, in fact. So that's, that's excellent. Okay. Um, so thanks again.